Hello, and welcome to Masters with Masters. I'm Ed Hoffman, the NASA Chief Knowledge Officer, and this is a special uh, series where we bring together expert practitioners and leaders uh, who talk about issues related to programs, projects, engineering, and the work that we do at NASA. In this particular case, we're fortunate to be at the Marshall Space Flight Center, and uh, we have two wonderful guests, Dr. Dale Thomas and Dr. Helen McConaughey. Uh, before we get started, I do want to thank the folks at Marshall for arranging this, and uh, our Marshall Space Flight Center Chief Knowledge Officer, Dale Thomas, and the Knowledge Integrator, Jennifer Stevens, as well as the Public Affairs Office and uh, NASA TV and the folks associated with Marshall for making this happen. These sessions are interactive, so after we have some initial discussions, I'll turn it over to some questions from the audience we have here. And of course, we record these sessions so that we have them available for the training programs that we do and online for people to access in a variety of ways. Let me start with a quick introduction of our guests. Uh, Dr. Dale Thomas uh, currently is the Associate uh, Center Director for the Mi Marshall Space Flight Center. He's also leading the formulation planning for the National Institute for Rocket Propulsion Systems, a multi-agency focus in terms of reinvigorating the agency's rocket propulsion community. He also serves as the Marshall Space Flight Center Chief Knowledge Officer, and of course everyone here knows he's had a very long career in terms of the major engineering uh, missions that we've had including recently serving as the NASA Constellation Program Manager, and he's worked at Marshall Space Flight Center since 1983, involved in many of the major issues, including International Space Station and uh, the Space Launch Initiative. So welcome, and thank you, Dale, for being here. Thank you, Ed. It's my pleasure. Also want to welcome Dr. Helen McConaughey, who currently serves as the manager of the Spacecraft and Vehicle Systems Department within the Engineering Directorate at Marshall Space Flight Center. She also chairs the Marshall Technology Investment Advisory Committee, serves as the Center Anti-Harassment Coordinator. She previously has a long experience with the Shuttle Spaceflight Program, specifically with Shuttle Propulsion Systems, Engineering and Integration Manager for the final eight years of the Space Shuttle. And she served and began her career in 1985 at the Marshall Space Flight Center as an aerospace engineer in structures and dynamics laboratory. And I welcome you as well. Thank you. I'm glad to be here also. And so both of you have had uh, phenomenal careers uh, at NASA and at Marshall. And the starting point I'd like to ask is, how did you get to this point in time? How did you get started at NASA? And how did your career uh, uh, kind of uh, proceed? Who first? Helen? All right, good. Well, um, I came here after first, my first job out of graduate school was at Mississippi State University. I was an uh, assistant professor for a few years. And I really wanted to work on something real. I mean, teaching, of course, is real, but I wanted to do something uh, where I could see a uh, product of, the, of what I was doing. So I uh, applied to NASA and uh, came to start working here. And so I started working as an aerospace engineer um, and have been there here for 28 years now. I, I think what I'd really like to do is just highlight maybe the early part of career because it forms the foundation of everything I've done since then. So I started out in the aerophysics division um, under a Mr. Uh, Werner Dahm, who was a very uh, knowledgeable uh, German uh, engineer slash scientist. Um, and so I really had the good fortune of learning from him his wisdom and his technical knowledge. Uh, I was in a branch called Induced Environments and worked on computational fluid dynamics of uh, complex internal flow fields. And that show, I, from that I really learned what complex analysis is all about, how it works, and how it plays with other discipline analyses such as thermal analysis, stress analysis, loads, etc. And that really helps me in my current job today. Uh, the next thing I did, which was probably the f most fun job I had, was uh, managing the technology engine test bed uh, project where we actually hot fire tested a space shuttle main engine here at Marshall in the West Test area for a number of years. And so I got this great hardware experience uh, learning about complex systems, both the engine system and the ground systems, and got to work with a variety of people. Um, it was for the purpose of integrating technology into a, a system, a real world system. So I learned about technology integration, I learned about testing, hardware, um, and uh, was exposed then to the world of project management and the wonderful world of test. So between just those two experiences, I got great uh, background in test and analysis 
and um, it really has formed the foundation for all I've done in engineering and in the space shuttle program. Uh, so it's been just it was a wonderful uh, opportunity and experience space for me. Yeah, and you can see also how it connects with a lot of the issues that you do in terms of the integration and you talked Absolutely. about the need to collaborate across different systems and units and obviously working with with folks and mm -hmm. probably um, the university background I would assume you're interested in how you educate and teach and again work together right so it's been a it's been a theme there Dale what about about you you uh, came yeah. from North Carolina State well I did but you know, to understand my story, you actually have to go back to about 1965. Um, my dad was uh, an engineering technician with General Electric, and he actually built the launch countdown sequencer for the Saturn V, mm -hmm. uh, a piece of ground support equipment uh, that they built here in Huntsville and then shipped down to the Cape. And uh, so he was working, you know, the long hours in the Apollo program, and, uh, you know, uh, I was very interested uh, in and uh, you know he would tell me the stories and I knew at a very young age my dream was to uh, work for NASA mm -hmm. and you know then went on to college and uh, to University of Alabama Huntsville here local and then I went on to North Carolina State for graduate school and um, when I was in the spring of 83 uh, NASA came to interview NASA Marshall Space Flight Center and uh, so I you know jumped at the chance to interview and when they actually extended me an offer it, took me all of about you know five seconds to pick up the phone and and tell them I was interested and uh, went to work here in June of 83 as a engineer in the systems analysis and integration laboratory and um, you know then uh, worked uh, some uh, very interesting jobs early on uh, they you know put me on some good work uh, working some mission planning for space lab missions uh, at the time uh, looking at different payload complements and what you know you could actually fly that would fit within the constraints of the orbiter in terms of power and thermal and so forth. And uh, then uh, Space Station came along then in the late 80s and I got to work uh, on the International Space Station. Uh, actually back then it was called the Freedom Station. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know then ultimately uh, they pulled me into the Chief Engineer Office and that was where I got to work uh, for Dave Mobley who you'll uh, be talking to in another one of these sessions. And uh, he was just a, a fantastic mentor. Helen talked about Werner Dom. I got to work with him some as well. And, and that's one of the neat things, you know, uh, just like Helen, I, I talk about the early assignments because you meet some truly amazing people out here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Helen could also probably tell you about Harold Schofield yes. and, you know, uh, Bob Ryan. And, and you know, uh, as when you're young and you meet these guys and they're the real deal, you know, and uh, you just soak everything in and uh, it, it really does uh, set you on a very good path. Mm -hmm. So uh, later on I took an assignment at Johnson Space Center and uh, unfortunately I did get to come back home and uh, then repeated that just a few years ago but uh, now I'm back here and I'm awful glad to be here at Marshall for the twilight of my career. Well you know you may, you may have another 30 years. So. I don't think I got another 30 in me. I'm, I'm not trying to chase one of the Dom's right. record. <laughs> uh, both of you talk about the importance of the early years experience, and it sounds like um, one of the things that I hear a lot at NASA is you need to know your system. And so is that where you first develop your abilities, your discipline expertise, where you really understand? You worked on Apollo, you worked on shuttle, you worked on, I mean, the landmark human programs. And can you say maybe a little bit about how do you go about developing that level of expertise so you know the system, you know the engineering, and you develop that kind of competence that then becomes a springboard? Any thoughts on that? Well, I'll jump on that, and Helen will probably want to pile on, but you know, the, the thing you have to have is just the curiosity about mm -hmm. the system, not just doing what you know your job is, but actually wanting to know more and understand what's behind mm -hmm. it. And, uh, you know, the, the classic case that illustrates that is uh, Apollo 9, if I remember my sequences right, uh, is one of the Apollo missions, I'll put it that way, that uh, they get, took a hard lightning strike during ascent. And, uh, you know, everything's going crazy in the uh, uh, capsule, the Apollo capsule. And uh, this little young guy working a console named John Aaron says, no, don't panic, here's what you need to do. And the reason he knew that was because during one of the simulations, he had stayed there and they had took a lightning strike on the pad and he had seen exactly what happened. 
and they'd work through it. And that was not required. I mean, he was, you know, off the clock. It's just he was wanting to understand more about the system than just working his little part of the mission right. control. And uh, it saved one of the missions because they would have likely aborted had not, he not been able to just weigh in and say, this is what you need to do. And, and I just say that um, it's important to really go deep enough to really you, where you understand how things work and how it affects the system, whether it's analysis or hardware and whatnot, and understand how they interplay. And, and then from that, your knowledge can grow and, and go to the other parts of the system and understand how things work. But I found, for, in my case, that doing some serious analysis that affected, that, that related to multiple parts of the engine, let's say, and different, different uh, environments and so forth, and then going into a test world and dealing with hardware and actually seeing the hardware that I had been modeling, um, it just makes it gel and come together. And then from that, you can extrapolate to other, uh, other configurations, other hardware, other environments, and, and it just grows from there. Yeah, partly it seems, and it, it, you can see it in terms of both you, because when you talk about the work and all your missions, you smile and there's an injury. Yeah. And I think with <laughs> a lot of the, the great things about NASA is I think um, you talk about the fact that you work the extra hours or, or you do things that go beyond so you understand the limits of what you're working. But partly it seems because it's kind of a hobby, maybe, mm -hmm. more than a hobby, but you know, there's a joy, there's a fun that you want to understand and you want to kind of play with it and you go to a certain direction. Yeah, yeah and it, it, I think you hit the magic term, excuse me, Helen, no, uh, uh, play with it. And uh, if you have that natural curiosity that you're wanting to understand more and, and literally getting to the point of you're wanting to play with the system, uh, that's really what I was trying to get at, you know, just follow your curiosity. And most of the, most people here at NASA are drawn here for more than just a paycheck. You're here for yeah. a passion. And, uh, you know, if, if, if you'll indulge that curiosity, it will serve you well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and really, we work on really cool stuff. Yeah. And so that does a lot in and of itself. And then as Dale said, I, I really believe people come to NASA to be part of something bigger than themselves, to work on something that matters. It's really important and can, can change the world in, in positive ways. So it's, you know, it's more than just doing your task. It's, it's part of something much bigger and important. Yeah, no, that comes through. And I guess that connection I'll make to doing something bigger and, and being part of a larger team is the issue of collaboration. Because mm -hmm. obviously at a, at a baseline, you have to have the ability, the discipline, expert, you know, that kind of curiosity. But then it comes down to everything we do is in a team and across centers usually and industry and international often. And so, um, you know, how important is the collaboration in terms of being able to work with others when you have your ideas, smart people, and, and how do you collaborate? And, and how do you go about maybe developing, you know, the effective collaborative relationships with other people across the center and other disciplines at other centers and particularly when it's some of the issues you know you're going to be in disagreements with of what the right way is and uh, probably one of the obviously one of the reasons why you've been selected to increasing leadership positions is the ability to work with others can you can you maybe talk about how do you go about doing that yeah i think uh, there are a couple of really important factors one is to recognize that by working with other people, you can do much more. Uh, so it's important to embrace other people's capabilities and, and to recognize and that many other people have a lot to offer. And so you want to try to mine that. Um, it's also really important to have an attitude, I think, of uh, uh, assuming the best in people and viewing them as possible collaborators and partners rather than competitors or rivals because I believe that sort of sense of rivalry can really inhibit um, progress so looking to people and having and, and assuming the best of them and and expecting them to bring to the table their uh, good intentions their great skills and to work together as partners it just is, is very powerful yeah so the, the the value of that and the enjoyment i guess you get out of that well right because of the people factor yeah. but then it's just and when you have a lot of uh, smart motivated people working together on something you can just accomplish so much more right. than doing it as an individual and they would have and i mean partly because you're you're in when you're doing engineering of complex things arguments are part of the equation and you're also mm -hmm. proposing you know different missions and so the people that 
some cases maybe you're competing with, I don't know if that's the right word, or also people then you're going to collaborate with, and how, did, how have you approached that in terms of your, your career, that, that, you know, the ability to, mm -hmm. I don't know, disagree, maybe even fight, at the same point you need to have this team, this collaborative effort that Helen was talking about. Yeah, and, and I'll go back to uh, my early days again. Um, there was uh, a natural tension between us Marshall guys and those JSC guys on the International Space Station. And, you know, when you're uh, young and you don't have the network, it was easy to call the JSC engineers those JSC engineers. But, you know, uh, working the systems, I had to go work with some of them. And, you know, when you started working with them, uh, you realize, you know, those are passionate engineers, you know, they shared the same values that I did. Right. And all of a sudden they became team members instead mm -hmm. of uh, competitors. And so that's that's the whole thing is you, um, like Helen said, you have to assume best intent. Just go work with the people that you have an opportunity to work with. And you're going to find out that uh, they're going to become very good friends and, you know, they're professional colleagues as well. And so it, it'll address a lot of that. And there are, are times, uh, you know, when, uh, you know, two passionate people about something, if you never erupt in any disagreements, uh, then in, one of you is not passionate right. enough, okay? <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's one of the things I've learned over the years is, you know, I've seen and I've been a part of, you know, in some meetings, uh, very heated debates, <laughs> for, to use a civil term on that. But you know, then when it's over, then it's over. You know, it's settled and you know, we're back to normal uh, after the meeting is over. Right. And uh, there's no disrespect on either side. And uh, people who have seen some of these, uh, you know, debates who, hadn't, who aren't used to that mode of operation, uh, you know, they wonder how you can resume civil, uh, you know, discourse with someone after such a heated argument and, you know, but after you get to know someone and you've uh, been through some of that, it, that's second nature to you because they're teammates. And, uh, you know, so uh, you work with them in, in the good times, you work through the bad. Right. And so partly also that the nature of the, the work that we have and sort of even a part of is, you know, just superior, you know, type missions, you know, that, that you have to be able to come together. And also, I mean, there's a lot of research that says teams that are kind of emotionally flat where there is not arguments are the ones you have to worry about mm. because it's just not, yeah, I, I mean, it. think about, you know, just being in a relationship as a couple, there's going to be disagreements mm. and when you multiply that by a lot of different players, if there's passion there, there's going to be a lot of different yeah, things going on. And you mentioned on. the complex systems and, and Helen will tell you as well that, you know, there are always different ways to address a problem and, you know, depending on exactly where you're coming from, one way will look better than another. And, you know, sometimes at the end of the day, somebody just has to pick one. And that means somebody, even though they thought they had the best answer, is going to go away, you know, uh, dissatisfied. And that's right. the way it works. I've been on that end, too. Yeah. Yeah. Throughout the career. I think another uh, thing that's really important in the collaboration is um, ha having this common sort of unifying uh, purpose. Um, so when you all can rally around this common purpose, it can make a, really make a difference. Absolutely. Um, mm. I think the most striking example of that in my career was when I was working shuttle. <clears throat> and uh, because everyone, and it was a huge team that spanned uh, at least three centers plus a, a lot of contractors, but everyone was just committed to f launching the shuttle safely and successfully executing the missions. And, and everybody felt a part of that, no matter what your role was. And so in that, it was powerful. And there I saw this teamwork and partnership between Marshall and Johnson and Kennedy that I have not seen since. There wasn't bickering or, or this rivalry, intercentral rivalry stuff. Uh, we certainly had disagreements on how to approach things, but we still, we were all part of this team and we were all unified by this grand purpose. And so I think that was really important. So let me follow up with you in terms of the, the notion of, you know, the team. <coughs> and again, partly why you've been, had these opportunities is people see you as very good at building teams. And so what advice would you give to a uh, to a young engineer or to a project leader uh, who's getting to the point where they have to build a team, uh, whether it's a team at their center or it's a team that's cutting across, 
you know, different organizational units. Any, yeah, yeah. how do you go about that? I, I'd say, uh, kind of following on what I just said, there, there, there needs to be sort of a common purpose that everyone can feel a part of. Um, <clears throat> And that, and that the lead leader would rally around that purpose to kind of pull people together. And so everybody needs to know what that is. It may seem obvious, but right. I think that's kind of the core unifying thing. And then I think it's really important for the leader to be, to, to, to care about the team and for the, pe the team to know that the leader cares about them. And so that implies some openness, uh, uh, transparency with people. It in involves including people, listening to them, asking for their opinion. Um, so that people feel like, yes, I matter. Uh, right. And that breeds this kind of sense of loyalty and commitment and connection. And then I think it's also really important um, for the leader to uh, respect everybody and to really to have this implicit trust so that you assume, again, people are bringing to the table their best intentions and their, their good skills and so forth. Uh, and I think that also needs to flow just beyond the team, but even to the partners of people you interact with, so that people on the team can see that, yes, this leader is respectful, this leader is trusting, because it sets the tone for them to follow. And that I just think it helps to build a, a really strong team. Uh, one other factor, I think, is expressing appreciation, because everybody wants to be appreciated. And so if the leader sees me, knows me, knows what I do, and appreciates me, boy, I, I will really uh, put out a lot of effort to uh, contribute. Right, and so you get into the key themes of a leader who has respect, which kind of plays out of being able to, to listen to people and pull them in, and inclusion, you didn't use that mm -hmm. word, but particularly when you're working with folks from different locations and different backgrounds, uh, they expect probably <coughs> disagreements, but they want to feel that they're being heard. Right, exactly. And the, the, the gratitude, the appreciation mm -hmm. that you, you point to. Um, Dale, I mean, again, you've had a long career and a lot of different issues. How do you do, what are some of the roadblocks? What are some of the problems that you face that you have to deal with when you're in that role of, uh, you know, working with a team? Yeah, uh, well, first off, uh, I want to start by saying I, I thought Helen did a great job of, you know, uh, capturing the key uh, ingredients Thanks. in building a good team. Uh, and I was hoping you weren't going to ask me to add to that because I didn't really have a whole lot to add to what she said. See, that's why I didn't add to that. And I appreciate that, Ed. Um, and, but she's absolutely right, and, and I'm going somewhere with this, that it all starts off with the purpose. You know, okay. you have to go back to the, to the why. You know, you can have a tough problem to solve, okay? But if the tough problem you're so trying to solve is not relevant, there's not a big why to it, it's academic. And, right. you know, that's important at a university, but not you know, right. necessarily at NASA. And, you know, if you've got that right, a lot of things fall into place. And what, so getting to the roadblocks, what I've always uh, encountered myself with teams is, um, you know, sometimes when the environment will change or, you know, you don't have, or I didn't have a real clear understanding of that why myself. Yes, I knew the problem we were trying to solve, but why did it matter? And the teams will start to drift and lose a little bit of lock on that. And, um, you know, it's one thing, uh, like Helen was talking about, when you've got a good high-performing team and everybody uh, understands why you're here, the purpose matters, and, and, you know, that will unify and keep everybody rowing in one direction. But when you lose a little bit of lock on that or, you know, uh, you've, you've just gone through some policy change or something and, and all of a sudden uh, the team can lose its vector its purpose and uh, getting it re relocked if you will right. is the biggest challenge I've had on on leading teams you know uh, a lot of people will talk about uh, you know uh, the importance you know uh, the different personality styles and those kind of things and and those are all important uh, but to me you know having a, a noble cause if you will uh, is the number one ingredient and if, if you right. If you lose that, then a lot of these other things, if you will, can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Yeah, and that kind of that made me think of uh, maybe a follow-on <laughs> in terms of the team. So when you take over a team or a mission, you know, what are the, the, the starting points that you want to establish? One of the things I'm hearing from you, Dale, is the purpose of what we're doing has to be clear why we're here. Why does it matter? And the ability to keep a focusing point yeah. from all the distractions. Are there any other things that you look to do when you first start a program? 
when you, you first come together as a team. Yeah, I think it's important also to communicate to your team s something about you. What these are these are my values, or these are the things that I think are important. And and when you're communicating to your team, sort of think out loud so they know what you're thinking. They know why you do what you do because it really helps them to sort of gel with you. Right. Yeah, uh, one of the things I talked about working for Dave Mobley earlier that, that he taught me was over time, a team will take on the personality of its leader. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if, so it goes back again to that purpose, but, uh, you know, if it's a problem uh, that I think's important and, you know, I can bring passion to the job and energy and I'm curious about it and I'm exploring and I'm digging, uh, that will infect the entire team. Mm -hmm. And so that's why that's so important. Right. Just to yeah, I agree. add on to Helen. So you become like a virus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Basically. Uh, a, a good virus. A good, that's a good why virus. you want to be good. <laughs> and and, uh, yeah. So one of the traps to avoid is getting a, a developing a mindset or a, or a sentiment among the team of where you've got rivals. I kind of alluded to this or before where right. the uh, us versus them or you know some kind of conspiracy theory or creating you know the the we got to watch out for those guys because they're out to get us or you know so you really want to avoid those sort of traps and instead rally around the positive and the goodness and so the leader by showing the respect and the trust and assuming positive intent on the part of you know your counterparts at JSE or whatever y you can I think that can really set a positive tone and help the team to be much stronger and more productive and, and just generally happier. Yeah, and it sounds like also then you'd need to be able to, just the definition of team at a place like NASA is it, kind of fascinating because when most organizations think of team, they're thinking of the people that are right there with them. Right. And then at NASA, not only do you have across the center different disciplines, but you have the other centers. Mm -hmm. You also have headquarters. Uh, you have uh, you know different partners, and so it's easy probably to interpret things that don't go the way at a certain point in time you want it in terms of us them. Right. And you got to avoid that. I really do. That's what you're saying. Yeah, and that, that's why it's so important when you have opportunities to work with people from other centers to take right. advantage of it, because us versus them is a lot harder to fall into that mindset when you actually know them. Mm -hmm. Right. So when you come together and exactly. do rotations or the, the, the training yeah. programs where you're all mm -hmm. together. Us versus them is invariably when that other person is just a name on an email or something. Right. Well, by the, if you see something as a them, then the communications are going to yeah. have to close it, it, down. It's, it feeds it's on itself. Right? Yeah. Um, one, so all, the, all of NASA is going through major change at this point in time in terms of uh, you know, the, the, a new cycle, in terms of closing down shuttle and going mm -hmm. in new directions. Um, and one of the issues that I hear a lot about um, from the workforce is you know, the, um, how do you find the balance between the issues of we've learned historically the importance of having a disciplined approach to engineering, uh, a method to, and process to the programs we do to try to minimize you know, failure. At the same time, we're also encouraged to, you got to do things cheaper and, you know, can't you innovate? And that sometimes leads to why do we need, you know, all that process. And so how do you approach, and I'm sure this is nothing new, when you, when you probably started in terms of shuttle or return to flight or a station, you probably get into that balancing act of how do you find that sweet spot, if there is one, between we need to be disciplined and we need to be focused and we need to follow the process between we need to adapt and we need to innovate and we need to do this faster. I mean, how do you approach that? How do you even think about it? Well, I'll, I'll jump on it. Yeah, go first. Uh, you know, to me it's the difference between uh, taking an informed risk versus taking a reckless risk. And uh, an example is we, uh, that I think is a good illustrative example is uh, the recent Marshall test on the composite cryo tank. That was a game-changing technology project here at Marshall. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way they worked through that I thought was excellent. The team uh, had gotten the, the article in and uh, all of their uh, analytical models showed them that uh, the margin was inadequate in one of the areas on the tank. And uh, so they weren't sure, you know, exactly what to do about tests. So they, you know, stood down examine the models, you know, talk through the consequences of failure, you know, really 
you know, rationalize her way through it. And at the end of the day, they went ahead and proceeded with the test, okay, and it was a success, but even had it failed, it, you know, it, the test was taken because it was the right thing to do, right. or the test was conducted. Um, so the point is, you know, and the reason I wanted to get in front of Helen is because they had to deal with this every launch, and I knew she was going to lay out a great example, so I had to get in front of her. But, <laughs> you know, sale. uncertainty is a part of our business, and, uh, you know, every launch is, there is some rationale for why you can take a little bit of risk, you know, something is not exactly where it should be. Right. And you have to talk through it and understand it and decide whether, um, you know, it, it makes sense to go ahead and take that risk or to stand down and, and go take an action and delay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's what you really have to do is, uh, the whole difference in risk is taking informed risk that you've talked about, that you've communicated with other people versus just a, a reckless risk that, you know, something didn't show up where it was, but, you know, uh, you're in a hurry, so you're gonna go ahead and press anyway and just hope that you get lucky. Hope is not an efficient risk right. management strategy. So you follow your process and you, you also have to make informed decisions and obviously rely on the team uh, exactly. in terms of how you how you proceed. But you'll never get the risk to zero. Right. Right. right, right, right. Yeah, that's important. You'll never get the risk to zero. And so, uh, and, and it really depends on the situation. So if, if going back to, let's say, return to flight, and early on, they were, we were really wanted to make sure everything was going to be safe. So we kind of went back and combed through all the processes, the analysis and all that after Columbia and before we, we flew again. But ultimately, we needed to fly again. And so you, you can't get to a point where you're 100% sure that nothing will go wrong. Right. Uh, so. Uh, it, it, so you, you use your uh, processes that you know, your analytical tools that you know, and you get to where you feel comfortable. But ultimately there are times when you, you, know, you have to, to um, consider what, where's the gap in my knowledge, uh, in my certainty, what are the potential implications, uh, and you basically map, you have to map out what the potential risk is and what the likelihood, you know, the consequence right. and the likelihood and so forth. And as long as uh, everybody knows what it is and, and the risk is accepted, then you, you, right. you proceed forward. So again, right. it's, not this, it's not just a, a careless or a PBA, we used to call PBA, probably all right. Um, <laughs> yeah. We don't do that, you know. So you, you, you understand what the risk is and then you make this informed uh, decision. Uh, and it's important when that happens that you, if you're an, uh, an engineer, you're an analyst or a, a you know, somewhere along the line, many people on the team, but at the point where the, dis the risk is accepted, though, it's very important to just let it go. Um, and because it's the program managers or the administrators, or at some point, it's their responsibility to make that decision to accept that risk. And so, and I did see after return to flight, there were many people who felt so burdened and so troubled because of what happened with Columbia, and they felt personally responsible. And you know, it's just, you can't let that, you can't do that, because y you do the best you can, you communicate what you know, and then you have to just let the process work and trust the process and trust the people who are ultimately the final decision makers, and let it go. Otherwise, you'll just, you, you'll eat yourself alive. So I think that's an important uh, facet too. Now, um, in, a, in a different phase of uh, a program, so early on in a program, uh, there's more wiggle room. Uh, so you, you don't have something on the launch pad ready to go and there's not an astronaut, uh, a, a crew of astronauts uh, in the shuttle waiting to go. So it's, it, it relieves a good bit of the pressure. And then you really need to consider, so what's at stake here? Uh, where are we in the process? If this analysis I'm doing, let's say, uh, doesn't have the level of rigor that I would want to feel 100% confident, but then you could say, well, what's the implication of not having that level right now? What could happen? And normally, if, if it's an early in a design analysis cycle, well, there's going to be subsequent cycles. There's going to be testing eventually. There will be things that will prove out where, where you know, how accurate I am or am not. And so again, down the road, if it can get caught, then you can again say, well, you know, it's, no one's gonna die, uh, I'm not gonna destroy some major hardware right now because where you just have that wiggle room. So it's important to assess what's at stake, where you are in the context you are at that time, and, uh, and adapt yourself accordingly.
Right. So, so the earlier it is, the more wiggle room you have, Absolutely. or the, the more ability you have to experiment with mm -hmm. what's going right. on and how you want to respond to exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. But e even in that case, and Helen said this, but I just want to hit it hard: is uh, it's very important to communicate. Right. About it. If someone right. you know sees that themselves, okay, and and sees it like their margin is negative or whatever, and they say, "Well, that's okay. We've still got another cycle to go, and it's everything will be all right." Uh, you still need to communicate that because uh, sometimes the consequences of such a thing are not uh, linear or they're not totally, you know, falling within one particular sphere or one particular discipline. And uh, to be able to put that in the context is very important. So even when you do have opportunities to revisit it, it still needs to be communicated and aired. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't mean to suggest otherwise. No, you, you yeah, didn't. I just wanted to yeah. Well, to it's hit consistent that point with hard. what you said before, which is the team, you know, very is so important in terms of the communication, mm -hmm. the respect, the, 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 the uh, hearing what people have to say and the collaborative relationships. And um, it, it's funny, if I, I think of when I ask project managers or systems engineers what's the most important thing, they you know, probably 90% of the time they go to communications mm -hmm. because the things that you're saying is that there's so many different disciplines and you can run into a danger where you have well-meaning people who are focused on their mm -hmm. own thing. And so particularly under pressure, I think that would be the norm. Let me see what I can contribute as opposed to being able to, to experiment and see and to understand at that larger level and to keep the communications going. So. Yeah, and we saw several years ago, it was back in the 90s, remember there was a, the classic case of a orbiter that was headed to Mars, and right. you know, it was the metric English oh, right. uh, issue, and there was an engineer uh, you know, in the system, he knew exactly what the problem was, and he'd even tried to communicate it a time or two, and he couldn't get anybody to listen, so he finally quit, right. and the point is, he shouldn't have quit. Yeah, it, you got to keep you know, fighting that yeah. communication, and uh, the, the individual you know, accountability. I know that during the uh, return to flight after Columbia, one of the things that changed was the governance and mm -hmm. partly a, there was a lot of discussion of making sure that any individual who was here, no matter how, if they saw something wrong, they had a path, whether it was engineering or, or program or safety, to raise it and right. that importance of communicating that, you know, we're all part of that and, mm -hmm. and to, to deal with that. Um, we have a, an audience here uh, at Marshall and so I was going to see uh, what questions you might have for, for Helen and Dale. And uh, is there anyone who has a question? Okay. You just talked about, uh, particularly when you're in the design phase, uh, the need to communicate those irregularities you have. One of the things that came up in the Constellation program that probably comes up in every program is the difficulty of communicating those irregularities across the very disparate team and particularly across the lines of contractor and government. Um, can you talk about some of the barriers that come up to those communications and how you deal with those? Well, uh, you, you hit a very good problem and, and um, unfortunately there's not a pat solution to the one about where uh, you have a, an issue uh, that crops up, say, within the contractor that the contractor is aware of, and uh, they may be disincentivized by their contract to actually mm -hmm. share that with the government. And um, so, what you have to do in all those cases uh, is, in any contract, uh, you know, work as quickly as possible to set up good communication channels. Uh, what I've always found over the time, it's just like the us versus them problem we were talking about earlier that. Uh, the sooner you can get to know uh, some of your peers inside uh, of the contractor's organization, um, the, it starts becoming an us and another us as opposed to an us versus mm -hmm. them. And you know, the contract is a necessary vehicle and we have to respect it, but uh, oftentimes that's used as somewhat of an artificial barrier uh, to communications uh, as opposed to uh, the real thing. And um, once you can get those relationships with your peers and establish some trust, uh, the communications will flow a little more freely. Um, and uh, that's probably the best advice I can offer uh, on that. I mean, I've found it and um, 
you know, fortunately, early in the contracts, the problems tend to be less severe than later, you know, when you're, you know, getting the hardware ready to be delivered. And so you just put conscious effort to building those relationships over time. And, uh, you know, one of the things we at NASA are prone to do, uh, and this is part of the, the us versus them on the contractor side, is they're afraid if they tell us a problem, we're going to descend on them with a horde of engineers to help them solve their problem, okay? And, you know, sometimes we need to hold back and let them have a chance to solve their problem. So that's another thing we need to do is be aware of their behaviors sometimes and when they tell us about a problem uh, that we don't give them negative consequences in terms of, you know, giving them too much help. So uh, those are the two things I would offer in response to that. I know it's not a totally good answer, but I, I don't know how to give you a totally good answer. And the only thing I would add to that, whether it's a contractor or on the civil service side, that when irregularities come up, when problems or issues come up, it's really important not to um, villainize whoever mm -hmm. is responsible for that particular piece of hardware. You know, stuff happens, and so, and, and we need to realize when people are doing designs and doing analyses, they are doing what they believe is right. And so we don't have people out there trying to screw up the system. Yet sometimes the way that we can become critical of others, it, it's almost implicit that we think, oh, they really, you know. And so I think it's important how we speak and how we uh, respect our, our coworkers in all that, um, that we don't make it personal. And that it is the we where we want to embrace the problem and go figure out how to make it right um, as opposed to uh, throwing rocks. And that really will help the, the communication. I think uh, tremendously, mm -hmm. um, whether it's a design problem or and I'd like to hit on the systems uh, engineering a little bit if we can because um, my experience in shuttle was where we had you know we have different elements we had an engine and an external tank a booster you had the orbiter you had ground systems you had all these different parts that had to work together for the system to operate properly and you can have something uh, change in one element that can have a ripple effect and affect the system and maybe that change is optimal for the element but it can have a more uh, not a non-optimal uh, effect on the system and so it's really important to as doing the system engineering and the system integration to again embrace the system as a as a whole and so and and the, the, so that the different elements feel a part of that and feel comfortable um, so that if something goes wrong, they won't uh, feel like they're going to be criticized or they're going to be attacked because their element caused an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, because if that's happened, then it has a couple of effects. Number one, they're going to be less inclined to share things. Mm -hmm. They're going to want to make sure they get it fixed and take care of everything first before they let it out of the bag. And then it also causes the system organization to be viewed as a police force or you know some kind of group that's uh, you're going to be suspicious of because they're going to out, out to make you look bad. Mm -hmm. So it's just really important to avoid that kind of a, a thought process. Yeah, that's a great. There's a great example that I read um, in a uh, article where they were talking about a, <coughs> uh, I guess, an aviation mechanic, you know, for airlines, and he had he realized that he lost one of his tools and didn't know where it was, and obviously, in terms of flying, you know, what can that lead to? And so you get to the point of does he say that to people, which means that I, you know, I uh, potentially, you know, created a problem for that, or you know, do you keep quiet? Well, he raised it. Of course, they then investigated everything. They found the tool, and uh, then the question is, how does management deal with that? And what they did is uh, they gave him an award awesome. yeah, for coming forward, so, yeah. and obviously <coughs> that communicates what you're talking about. And, mm -hmm. and again, I think it's so important because the nature of our work is it, so complex. And at the end of the day, it's humans doing all these things. So things aren't going to go optimal. Mistakes are going to be made. And how do we deal with that mm -hmm. in terms of approaching it? Interesting. Other questions um, from the audience over here? Okay. Um, I've enjoyed your uh, thoughts on leadership from both of you. I've got a two-part question. As a seasoned leader, I'm sure that there's days that are really great and then there's those bad awful days that um, you know you're just wondering why am I here as a leader how do you re-energize yourself and kind of pick yourself up to 
um, continue to lead your team and, and put a good face on maybe a bad situation. And then my second question for both of you is um, maybe if you could share some of your thoughts of those aspiring leaders that we have here at Marshall and Helen specifically for women in leadership, um, how we might encourage them uh, to continue to develop themselves if that's what they aspire to be, that uh, we can continue this great leadership at Marshall. Uh, sure, I'll start. <laughs> so uh, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, you have uh, good days and you have a few bad days. Uh, and you, you just work through uh, the bad times. I really don't have to work personally to get myself back up because I love working at NASA. And, um, you know, I can always find something to get myself up. Now, when I'm grinding through spreadsheets, dealing with budget reductions and stuff, or, you know, those are not fun parts of the job. Uh, but you work through those. And, uh, you know, then if I'm really lucky, you know, uh, I'll have some time on the schedule to, uh, get out to one of the labs and and see something see some hardware you know for example we got the uh, James Webb uh, Space Telescope backplane here at Marshall it's about to go into uh, XRCF for testing and I'm sure gonna go down and see that before they roll it in the chamber and uh, I'll be on a, a high for about a week after that so you know that's, that's the time for me to schedule some of that grunge work that I don't really look forward to doing uh, to ride on that but the the neat thing is there's so much good work here uh, going on that you can always find ways to get up and the other thing is we work uh, we're blessed to work here with s simply some mm -hmm. amazing people and uh, you know uh, like for example occasionally I get to be in meetings with Helen and uh, you know she is just an up person <laughs> and it's hard to be around her without not catching Thank some you. of that um, and we have a lot of people like that. So the other way is if, if I can't get out and see some hardware, invariably I'm going to run into somebody who's going to pick me up. So those are the two ways I deal with it. And, you know, fortunately, those, uh, those down times don't endure. Yeah, I'd say um, when I find myself feeling frustrated or, you know, cynical or whatnot, I usually I'm pretty self-aware and I'll catch myself and then I try to just back up and think okay what's the big picture why am I here and at my core what matters and normally the things that are irritating me are petty or or I'm making assumptions about other people's motives that are you know that can't be right and so then I try to unwrap myself uh, from around the axle so to speak and just and, and step back and really look at the big picture and think and, and recenter so that that's what I do uh, in terms of um, uh, young engineers who aspire to be leaders and so forth, um, and particularly you talked about women, but I think what I'm going to say will apply to either. Uh, one, uh, I think, very important um, uh, factor that can help you is to find a mentor or find somebody that you trust that you can sort of uh, bounce ideas off of. And there are formal mentoring programs and all that that exist. But what I would suggest is that you find somebody out there that you know or you have heard of that you think would be compatible with you, uh, your, whether it's your background, your personality, your goals, whatever. And just go ask that person, hey, could, would you be a mentor for me? Or would you, um, could I spend some time talking to you and bouncing ideas off of you? And I think almost uh, without uh, exception the person will be flattered and will be happy to share some of their time and experience with you so I would urge people to take that initiative and be bold have courage and go uh, ask uh, and if you don't know someone you could ask your supervisor or some of your co-workers hey who do you think would be a good um, you know a good person for me to connect with because just having someone to uh, that with whom you can vent uh, or share frustrations or share some of the difficult experiences you're having and and get that kind of feedback um, it can really help you and encourage you because you can get kind of auger in sometimes and feel discouraged and having someone to talk to who can kind of give you hope and shine a light on the future can really help I think so that's one that one thing I'd suggest yeah, I guess I, I would follow that up because the mentoring thing I think is so critical because mm -hmm. um, there's so much in terms of not just the work and the technical but the social and the political and the different right. you know, different dynamics and hard work. Um, who are your mentors uh, and how did you go about you know getting them? Did you say hey I want to work with you or in each of you I mean yeah. I'm sure that 
folks have impacted you. How did you go about that and well, who I helped had, you? I had an awesome mentor, um, Luke Schutzenhofer, probably many of you know him. Mm -hmm. uh, I met him the very beginning when I first came here and initially he was um, peripherally involved with our, our branch. He eventually became my branch chief and it was through that that it naturally happened. So I didn't go ask, it just naturally right. happened. But Luke um, is an open, uh, just a very open and accessible person. And through the course of our uh, interaction, I learned so much from him. But he would tell stories uh, that there was so much to learn from. Uh, he would actually sort of give us technical direction, get up at the board sometimes, write equations. and. Uh, and then, and he also told us about, I'm saying us because it wasn't just me, there were right. other people in the branch, sort of the unspoken or unwritten rules of engagement, how to get things done. So, you, and you kind of learned about things that matter and things that don't matter. I remember once um, him saying, well, yeah, there's rules that you need to follow and then maybe there's some rules where you just kind of don't have to, and you just kind of right. don't worry about it so much. And it's really true. I mean, you have to prioritize and you have to screen things. And so, Luke taught me so much and then, um, and he gave me good feedback. And I think one of the most powerful things he did was, uh, metaphorically, he sort of pushed me into the deep end of the pool. Uh, we, had, we were talking about a certain kind of project and an approach we were gonna do. We we're gonna set up these uh, consortiums. And he told me he wanted me to lead one. And he just said, just go do it. And I was like, well, yeah. <laughs> what am I saying? I was a little bit um, taken aback because it involved communicating with uh, serious people at, in different companies and different centers and I was thinking well who am I to, to do this and he just threw me out there and it was it was amazing so yeah, he, he had was a confidence great. in oh, you he had and he, such confidence in me right go. he did yeah. so uh, he, he was just amazing and I still to this day um, grin very largely whenever I see him yeah it means so much or to me. talk about him oh right okay yeah. <laughs> he caught me uh, yeah, I'm sort of like Helen, uh, the mentor, uh, my first mentor, it, it, and to this day we stay in touch, but I don't think I've ever asked him if he would be my mentor. He just sort of assumed that role, and uh, I talked about him earlier, it was Dave Mobley. Mm. And uh, so I came to work for him in the late 80s, and, uh, you know, we only worked in a pure supervisor-subordinate relationship for probably four or five years, uh, but we've stayed in touch since, and uh, and I still call on him from time to time. And then uh, I've picked up some others as well. Uh, Bob Ryan is someone I go to frequently, uh, you know, to, to just talk things through. And, and something I learned from Dave, and I'm sure Bob would echo this as well, is usually, you know, when I go talk to him, uh, I know the answer before I walked in the door. I just <laughs> need to talk it through. and. Uh, so invariably they just sit there and listen and nod and, and give me a little bit of affirmation, if you will. Although occasionally uh, I'll, uh, I'll get a, a little bit of a yank from one of the two of them. But those are the two I count on most. Yeah, people who are looking over and uh, you know, guiding and maybe stretching. It sounds mm -hmm. like stretching capability. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And, and that's one thing I would uh, also encourage, uh, you know, especially people younger in your careers, is uh, failure is not fatal. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. reckless failure can be very damaging. But uh, if you have an idea on how to do something better, mm -hmm. okay, or an idea on how to do something, you know, right. that could be of value, um, you know, talk about it with, uh, you know, your leads, your supervisors, uh, your peers. It, it goes back to that communication thing. Um, and assuming you get some affirmation, you know, don't be afraid to run with that idea, knowing that, uh, and like I say, stay in communication. Uh, I've pulled some major face plants over my career, okay? Um, but you know what? Um, you always learn from those, and then you pick up and you can build on it. And it's just a cruel fact of life that we learn more from our failures than our successes. And so I've learned more from those face plants than I learned from the things that went right. 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 And uh, that will serve you well. Like I said, the, the key is it's just like a risk. Don't, don't go cowboy, you know? Uh, talk it through and talk it through with people who have a stake in your success, you know, on this particular idea. And uh, take that chance and uh, then when, you know, things work out as they inevitably will, it's uh, very fulfilling and it will help you grow a whole lot as a professional uh, and in your leadership skills as well. One of the things that you, you've talked about throughout in our time together is 
the collaboration, the related, mm -hmm. having a sense of understanding the system in terms of early career. Um, what advice would you have for the young <coughs> professionals who are joining NASA or you know probably any organization in terms of those who are interested in the engineering side or systems uh, or projects uh, or you know basically having the kind of successful careers that you've had what what would you indicate in addition to the importance of mentoring um, I'd say uh, be competent know your stuff and learn more and continue to learn and grow so wherever you are you know really plow yourself into it and try to to uh, become stronger and more even more competent I think that's really important um, because with that comes additional respect and with that will come additional responsibility and so forth so and then to have courage and to work and play well with others I think all of that's really important right. okay so the competence the ability, understanding the nature of your work, the the, the attitude of working well with others, mm -hmm. the collaborative kind of skills, the mm -hmm. gaining the experience from others, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. and and avoid communicating a sense of a desire for self-aggrandizement because it's not about you, it's about the team and it's about the mission. Right. Uh, those people who are all about trying to get ahead and if it becomes clear, right. that tends to be damaging because right. that's not what we're about here. And eventually it will. I mean, mm -hmm. because the nature mm -hmm. of the. The, everything is an interface, mm -hmm. yeah. and so you can see. You know, uh, what I've uh, found and what I always uh, suggest to people who are contemplating, uh, you know, uh, career changes or something is I just tell them follow your passion, mm -hmm. because uh, and and that will lead to all the things Helen was talking about. Uh, you know, where you're passionate about something, you're going to put forth the extra energy. Uh, you know, follow curiosity, try to understand it, uh, as Helen was saying about competence. There is no substitute for knowing what you're talking about, okay? And where you don't know what you're talking about, have the curiosity to dig so you can understand it, so then you'll know what you're talking mm -hmm. about. But passion is the energy that drives That's all that. Exactly so right. I always right. encourage people, go to something that, you know, it's hard to go to bed at night and you look forward to getting up the next morning because it's something that you want to work on. It's something, right. it's a problem you want to solve. And yeah, play well with others you know, uh, be a, a, a sociable person. But if you're really passionate about the cause, it is, you know, about the mission, okay? Never try to make it about yourself. Uh, all that will take care of itself. Right. Very good. So somehow, I mean, this hour has gone really fast. It really has. To me, it seemed like half the time. Um, and some, the passion comes through, and obviously the competence in terms of the careers that have come through. I think that's been conveyed. And so I'd like to thank Dale, I'd like to thank Helen. It's been really enjoyable. And I uh, also want to thank Marshall Space Flight Center for setting this up, public affairs, uh, the knowledge, you know, folks, uh, the training organization, and certainly NASA TV for uh, making this uh, hour really enjoyable. And uh, hope that uh, the folks who are watching it uh, see some benefit from it and uh, continue to learn and uh, to, to stay passionate. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah.